Hi everyone, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I am Joan Borges. I am uh, uh, the conference president chair at the IYCN. And on behalf of the IYCN and EYCN, would like to welcome to this uh, second session on the global conversation on chemists fighting COVID-19. So today uh, we'll have the second session of this webinar that will be uh, um, um, focusing on tools to drive remotely. And first of all, let, let me thank you very much for joining us and engaging in this uh, uh, initiative. In particular, uh, we'd like to thank the, all speakers and panelists for making themselves available, um, as well as for supporting this event, as well as uh, the kind support by IOPAC and EUCAMS um, uh, FLAC and the YCC for supporting us, for the encouragement, as well as for dissemination through Twitter. So before moving on, I would like to uh, call to the uh, stage uh, Professor Javier um, uh, Garcia Martinez. He's the president-elect of IUPAC and who will give you uh, some uh, words on, for the welcoming message as well. Javier? Okay, so welcome back. We had yesterday a fantastic session. We were running at full capacity. I know that almost a thousand people registered for this and my welcome remarks only to say congratulations to the young chemists, both IYCN and EYCN, for this wonderful uh, initiative. Today we are going to be learning about how to try remotely. One of the things that we are doing these days is to work from home, and that is also a challenge for scientists. So I don't want to take more of your time, but on behalf of IUPAC, I want to say congratulations for your leadership, guys. You are not only working remotely, but also you are leading remotely because you organize these webinars to help to help others. So I'm very impressed. We are all very impressed of you, and I'm just looking forward to to learning how to to thrive remotely. Hopefully, I will be able also to to thrive during the next few weeks. So thank you very much, Joao. Thank you, Javier, for this kind of words and introduction to the to this session. So let's go um, on with the webinar. But before going into the program, we'd like to introduce briefly about the two networks, so the International Young Chemist Network and the uh, European Young Chemist Network. So um, uh, I would like to share you, with you how you can engage with us, how, how can you join us and support uh, 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 our activities, and also propose the new initiatives that we can pursue uh, to the benefit of the whole community. So uh, how can you become a member? Uh, so you have, um, um, different uh, ways, so or either you are pursuing a, a chemistry uh, a related uh, course, um, or you are uh, less than 35 years old, or even if you are um, uh, older than the 35, so if you have completed a chemistry related degree, for instance a postdoc during the last five years, you are still eligible. And here in this uh, picture you can see uh, uh, the active uh, IYCN uh, members, so you can see that there are uh, a lot of um, of uh, countries in which we, we are not covered yet. So we'll be really glad to have uh, uh, delegates from these uh, countries joining us and make this really a global community. Even for those of you that uh, you see that uh, have already delegates uh, uh, as representatives for uh, uh, your uh, own country, you can still contribute and join uh, uh, our uh, teams. Um, I would like also to welcome you to uh, join us. And by that, you have just to fill in this membership form. You have here the link. And in there you can find the uh, information and uh, how to join the um, include the information on which team you think that you are uh, that will be more suitable and um, um, other information about the, the network so uh, uh, in which concern the vision of our team is to connect and to empower young chemists globally and we have the mission the statement to support and advocate for uh, uh, you uh, that are working across the uh, chemical science towards a globally sustainable future so please engage with us, uh, support us, and uh, look at the, our platform. So um, uh, you have here the, the, our email address, the, and there as well as different platforms for the media. Um, I would like to just to call your attention from to um, a nice uh, um, uh, initiative that we are currently pursuing, that is in the celebration of the 50 years of uh, Earth Day. Um, and we are launching a second uh, uh, competition on this uh, team. So uh, if you have uh, um, any particular experiment that you'd like to share related that links the chemistry and the, with the earth, so please uh, go ahead. You have here as well the link for it. Um, you can you have uh, the different rules and um, uh, a template, which the steps that you have to follow to engage with the audience, to explain our experiments, safety measurements, 
that we have to pursue their materials regions so everything is explained and uh, we have also to uh, we are also glad to inform that uh, the winners of this competition will receive a prize up to 250 us dollars so it's it's quite good so uh, and you are um, uh, all free to join irrespectively of your field um, and the uh, uh, area in which you are working, you just have to propose something related with uh, chemistry and the uh, earth. So uh, now I will handle the, the panel to uh, Antonio that will uh, uh, briefly explain and uh, um, uh, introduce the European Young Chemist Network. Antonio? Uh, thank you, Joao. Um, I wonder if I can... Uh, okay. Um, so here, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, this is the uh, AYCN. Uh, we are the joint division of uh, within UCAMS, and uh, we are uh, 40,000 uh, uh, young chemists around uh, around Europe. Just to give you an idea of, of the scope, and uh, you are basically as uh, similarly as the International Young Chemist Network. If you are below the age of uh, of 35, and, and if you uh, belong to one of the uh, the societies on, on, on this slide and uh, in, in UCAMS, uh, you are officially a part of, of AYC and you don't need to do anything else. Uh, we, uh, we, we have similar mission uh, uh, ideas as, uh, as in the International Gen, uh, Gen Chemist. I don't know if I can make uh, uh, this slide go on. Uh, can I, uh, Joe? Yeah. yeah. Um, the mission statement is just uh, as, an, as a general uh kind of ideas uh, to, to to provide a platform to for exchanging ideas and projects for for the young chemists around europe uh, is to try to to give you a, a sort of a more international uh, approach into in in uh, the very end in in europe to uh, to help you have the tools to uh, to thrive as this seminar is also uh, going on uh, but also to uh, to give you some some support on uh, on projects that uh, is not only you know, in on your country, and uh, and just based on that, I would like to uh, to go for the next slide. Uh, I I want to just bring your attention to the uh, European Young Chemistry Award that uh, we have the application open and uh, it's going to be uh, discussed uh, um, during the. Uh, DCCA, the European uh, the European uh, Chemistry Congress in uh, in Liverpool, hopefully this uh, this summer if nothing happens, this uh, result and uh, you can apply uh, here on the uh, until the 15th of May and uh, you have the link. So uh, if uh, if you are coming to the uh, to the European Congress, it's please feel free to 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 join. And we have a great uh, chemist, young chemist that are really like bright and uh, and try to, to, to join us there in this one. I don't want to take more of your time, so please uh, let's go to the to the session. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Antonio. So uh, uh, let's go and uh, into the uh, webinar itself. So um, as you might recall, so many, maybe many of you have assisted yesterday to the first session in which we uh, showed the clear role of chemistry in uh, addressing the, this uh, COVID pandemic so today we will be talking about the tools that and resources that we have to at our disposal to uh, drive remotely. And uh, um, uh, before that, uh, I would like to uh, mention that you can adjust your uh, screen to see uh, the the platform and the slide in the full screen. Um, so please uh, just look at the the chat the message that we have delivered. So uh, today, I was, as I was mentioned, we'll uh, be talking about the tools to succeed in this uh, challenging environment that we are currently facing. But we can bear in mind that these tools will be useful not only during this pandemic uh, outbreak, but also through life. So you will learn for sure different uh, ways that you can promote your mental health, how to commit, communicate effectively, how to engage with a virtual classroom. So for sure, it will be a, a, a great uh, session uh, and transversal to other situations in life. So um, uh, now I would like to first introduce the, the first speaker of this uh, session. We count really on the great lineup of international speakers that uh, uh, we thank very much for their availability and for supporting us. And the first one will be uh, Funman. Funman is the uh, scientist um, uh, educator um, at National University of Singapore. He has been involved and served to different boards 
uh, the International uh, Chemistry Olympiads, uh, IUPAC, uh, IYCN, which is the, the current uh, uh, secretary, and the FAMEN has been really uh, uh, involved on these uh, um, uh, tools to, uh, to uh, disseminate chemistry uh, through uh, online and implement really educational technology, technological tools to, uh, to improve the virtual learning. So uh, with that, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, um, Fanman to the webinar, and he will be talking about keeping and engaging virtual classroom for online learning to combat COVID-19. Fanman, please. Hi, thank you, Joel. Hi, everybody. I can't hear you, but I hope that you can, uh, at your own home, give me a round of applause, okay? I think you're all cheering me on. So thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to share my time with you, uh, sharing your time with me um, on this presentation. So um, my interactions is um, very interactive. So I need everybody here to take up a pen, piece of paper that you can write on because, you know, the topic is really on keeping an engaging virtual classroom, right, to combat COVID-19. So just get ready, okay, a pen, pencil, or any piece of paper. So, right, um, you can um, follow my uh, social media account to see some updates from Singapore. So I'm Fun Man, uh, Fung is my family name, and I'm also the um, IYCN elected secretary. Over here, this is the details. Uh, just one more time, make sure you don't forget it. I'm the instructor of chemistry and learning sciences from the National University of Singapore. Singapore. Here's my email, and you can always um, click the QR code if you have time to follow what I do in Singapore here. So first up today is um, you have to take out your mobile phone, okay? And tell me right now, where are you in right now as you're listening to this webinar? So everybody, can you go on to this poev.com slash funman? Just go on to it. You can type any name, answer this poll here. You see a screen popping up. And just indicate where in the world are you in right now? Okay. Oh, you see, it's popping up. We have people from Canada, the US, UK, Germany, see France, Spain, yep, popping up. Australia, Singapore is there, Malaysia, India. Wow, where's that place? I didn't know there's an island in the ocean. <laughs> so you see, this map is very good for Laurie, uh, Bailey, and Joel. Everybody from our scene, you see, we have people who are here, but they are not yet in IYCN, so please consider us and join. Okay, great. So we have the, the world with us. Wonderful. All continents represented. Yes, wonderful. Very good. Okay, okay. Whoa! South Pole. <laughs> okay, we keep it going. Okay, keep it going. So I'd like to share a bit with you um, some background on Singapore. You know, Singapore has been, in a way, pretty safe here. I'm now in office. I had my shower, I had my dinner, I came back to office. For one last time, because today there was the big news by the Prime Minister, but just want to recap how Singapore has done as a government. We are a small city state. Um, just last month, we were still going to work, having classes live because you no, know, we have been practicing contact tracing very well, and the uh, the rate of infection has been going up very very slowly. So compared to other parts in the world, we are pretty lucky and we are grateful for that. As you can see that uh, in Chinese News Asia, just on the 27th of March, the Prime Minister assured that right, it is important that the school remains open because it's better for people not to go to work and the kids won't get infected so much here, right? And that's why we're still offering like, you know, um, teachings and uh, a bit of a blended learning here. But as you see, as the day passes by, you know, things get more tragic. And just on the 1st of April, a couple of days ago, this is not April food there. Okay, you know what? The whole country, uh, the institutions start to adopt to a home-based learning, right? Instructors can teach a bit online. The children has to stay at home for once a week here. Uh, to learn to get used to this self system. Now today, right? This is just uh, how long ago? Um, four hours ago, we had the announcement: all school closed next week, right? So we can't come back to university. Of course, I know that uh, most of you here already have had a lockdown in your places. So, but the thing is, it has come to everybody, really. Um, so I'm just glad that um, because you know. Uh, we have been doing a lot of preparations online, at least myself and my colleagues here. So today I'm very happy just to share with you what are some of the things that you can do as a teacher or as a speaker. So right now, another poll here. What do you think of this webinar so far? Right? So on the bottom right hand corner, you see the total number of participants here. Um, on my chart, I see 256. There's no limit to the 
number of participants. So please answer, take out your phone, right? And just key in. It's the MCQ. Come on, numbers rising, 46. You need to go to this URL, poev.com slash farming, and then key in any name, join. It's very fun. And this won't be your last interaction for today's session here. Okay, so we close in about um, three, two, one, let's go. Okay, oh, awesome, doing pretty well here. So I can stop and say bye-bye to you already. <laughs> Just kidding, okay, let's continue, right? Let's push on. Right, so back to my topic here, how to be engaging, even though we are no virtual, uh, not really physically interacting here. Now, uh, people ask me, what is the magic sauce for this uh, synchronous classroom here? So this is how I teach normally, normally with my colleague or sometimes on my own here through the online. The magic sauce is shaking hand, <laughs> washing hand, engagement, engagement, engagement. Just stay engaging, okay, throughout, whether online or anywhere. Now, this is what students are used to before, you know, they have COVID-19, you know, before any lockdown here. They see a teacher here writing on the whiteboard, right? You know, we are used to it. But what uh, we have done so far is, right, we need to stay at home and then we have educators, you know, long time ago going on kind of TV style using on the tablet and just write um, drawings. And now, of course, you can turn on the webcam like how you see me here. Now, the thing is, uh, if you are doing this right now, I'll suggest that you always turn on your webcam because it's always good to see a human being. The reason is that in the past, I've tried all these various ways and students give me feedback, you know, that uh, I tried the Khan Academy and at the end of the semester, they told me that um, when the student here says, uh, can you rate this teacher from one to 10? And then the student say, oh, I do not recognize his face. Who is this person? And that's because you never show a face, right? And the other thing is I tried uh, the talking head for another semester and what happens was, uh, some students say, oh, it's very distracting. You know, you have got your face there and then you have your PowerPoint. And I ask, okay, so what? You can see me this, oh, sir, sometimes you have bad headache or your buttons are not right, but that's okay. But still, I believe that from the research, uh, having a face is good because you are, at least your students know that you are not a robot, okay? Um, so, well, for those of you who know about the light bulb here, so now see the top and bottom here. Um, if given a choice, which one do you want to uh, see your teachers teach? And I suppose it's the bottom here. And that's because, right, um, you see your teacher's eyes and face. We are all human beings who interact through these interactions, the eyes, you know, our facial movement here. You see the back of me, right? Like, just imagine I do this to you. And it is it is not interactive, right? So if you can, um, if you still have the chance to get a light bulb, buy a piece of glass and record yourself, I think it's very, very engaging, okay? But um, if you don't have this equipment, that's okay because, right, not, not all is not lost, okay? What you can do is, right, you can still have a way, I'm gonna share a bit of tips with you uh, to transform the classroom into a more engaging way. So again, let's roll back the time a little bit more, we, how we wish to go back to this, right? Just on March 13, when we still have live classes, you know, we started off with, okay, maximum 50 students, after that 25, and then 10, and next week is nobody can go to school. Now, this was what we done that uh, we had live tutorial, and then students need to sit there and then we do a swipe the you know, camera to do contact tracing to see you know who sits to each other so in case somebody who got sick and then we know that okay these are the person in the vicinity that we can trace back stay home quarantine but that was like really the last time because the next week it says okay you know what my class is more than 25 we can't operate any live classroom here so we recorded a live kind of a zoom lecture here you see that my colleagues are doing it it's just two of them they're sitting down but we are supported by our teaching assistants. So there are three of them here. We're very thankful. But again, you need them for certain reasons here, right? So it is in the library. Uh, again, we're trying to maintain some distance apart. And you see that there's a little camera here that uh, try to do a front of you and not through a webcam that's a bit close because you want to see a bit of your body like a bit more livelier, right? So this is how it looks like for three person, um, right? We sit down and then there's TV behind us. We just turn out our computer because at any time, only one person speak. But the other two are always responding to students' questions all the time if there's anything popping up here, right? So this is from the front view, right? Uh, you know, as the day get past, uh, it is not easy. So at some point, our TAs, they got fever, they stay home, so we have nobody to help us. So there's only three of us who can sustain a classroom here, but it's okay, we work fine. So again, this is how uh, the situation has evolved over the days here, getting worse. But again, uh, this is the main, uh, Main thing I'm going to share with you, how to do a, success, a successful online teaching, right? You have to engage audience. 
And as now you can see that I'm standing up and standing right really makes you more livelier. Try to have more breakout sessions if you can, even doing a Zoom lecture on GoToMeeting and be natural. It means right, if you have kids at home, I know you are most of you at home, just let your cats or dogs or even your kids scream. It's okay, right? Because you, you are just being human. Everybody is uh, in, this, in this together. So you know, now I'm in my office, but I have my uh, little liners with me. This is my little pet um, and your logo. It is okay to show a more human side. And the last one is to insert some activity for the students to engage or your audience, that's how I'm doing now. But the thing is, right, to have a breakout session, let's say you have a group designated from your university, it is very important to assign some numbers. If not, okay, group, uh, let's break out, have a discussion. And then they're like, okay, who's taking charge here? You have to assign someone like one, two, three, four, five. So the LOS in our term is the lead of the session. Okay, this week is lead number one. Next week is two. We do some rotation. So there's a bit of you know a leadership here, responsibility, because everybody at home, you know, you need someone to just step up and lead the session. Right. And um, what you need to tell the students, the audience is also turn on the webcam. Why is it important here? See, now they see each other, they're really doing work, right? It's the effort here. The other point to note is if you do not turn the webcam, you're just gonna see all these what uh static photos, and then people feel very demoralized. Is that, are you really there? You know, you have to unmute everybody so you start to chat lively like a real class. Okay. And the last thing is, right, you can also um, turn on the Padlet using some kind of chat, encourage the students to put in all these chats here, and you might be surprised. They actually respond to your questions. They are not engaging. In our culture here, we like to call themselves the keyboard warriors. So in fact, they raise more questions when they're behind the screen compared to in a classroom maybe because they are shy. Okay. But again, encourage them. So you see that people say, oh, students are not engaged, but there is a way, engage them. They reply to you. In a one and a half hour sessions here, we have about 467 chats. We are all even shocked. And you notice that it's not just one line of question. They even ask questions and we of course respond them. And that's why it's very important to have somebody, you know, to help to answer some questions, engage them, not just question come in and towards the end, then you answer it, the moment is lost. Now there's some free tools here that we use. It's called the Padlet here. Padlet is very good when you break up into group sessions here. This is a website they all can see. This X are like the whiteboard, you know, in class with a whiteboard, but uh, online, this is like the pseudo whiteboard here. You notice that uh, we group them into a couple of, of groups, right? Uh, K and L, and that's because, you know, in class, we need to have uh, not too many people to have a good engagement, but online, um, we might want to join them because some of them are not, uh, are not present. Maybe they are just doing something else. So if there was a time where uh, somebody was just alone and then nobody's speaking, it's, it's very lonely here, right? But again, you might think that, oh, two groups is great, having 10 or more people. Um, we have announcements saying that we limit to 10 people uh, getting outside, even online as well, so not too many. Now at this point, right, we can't do a gathering, it's a bit sad, but what is the message that you can share with your friends right now to uplift the spirit? What do you say to your students or to me or to the people in this seminar? Okay. And you can upvote the, all these messages. What is something that you say to uplift the spirit, to encourage them? Thank you, thank you. Come on, say, yeah, tell your students, tell your colleagues, you're awesome, okay? You got this, okay, good, you can upload, yeah. Thank you, all right, so let's continue. All right, so what about lab teaching? Some of us teach, teach lab here. Um, lab teaching, one way is, right, I suppose you have pre-recorded videos here. If not, there are certain videos online. If not, you can use mine. Um, you can always play them and ask student questions to uh, engage them. If they can't view it, let them see it, okay? Simple things. You can do on Instagram, YouTube, anything, and get them to submit some online assignment. Okay, very, very, very fun and also very lively. This is what students are used to. All right. Now again, it's about rules externally here because what we're trying to do is not get them to memorize facts, but observe something and then try to uh, get a sense of uh, what is the uh, understanding behind. So you try to go deeper in your processing. All right. Now the other thing is I iterate that try to stand if you can. I know that many uh, um, um, Zoom or even uh, webinars here uh, is is uh, very nice to sit on the sofa or what, right? But you know, he said we actually step down first, right? Because uh, you know it makes sense to have a um your pc or laptop in front of you and then you sit but we find that especially when we team teach here uh well 
you get you you're, when you're not talking sometimes you just find that you know yeah you you might yawn so it, you see we transform that standing give you more energy and it is really true right do you even teach when you, you're actually data you don't so you stand trying to stand is even more realistic it's like a real classroom here and this is how it looks like even with no audience you think there's an audience and people mold, mold after it now another point i want to give is right do it like the weather okay. presenter um, yeah. if you pop it out yeah. Um, with that like little, so you, you see there's like the, um, it says. Oh, is it? Okay, can I continue? All right. Carmen, one of it delays, so I was, was pleased that you can hurry up uh, to keep on. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, so um, do you like a weather presenter? I think it's very, uh, very uh, immersive. Activity time, I think I will skip it, okay? But I'm supposed to time you, and then you're supposed to write these words on your phone, and then I'll time you. But, uh, Normally, people take about 50 seconds, but please on your phone, you know, key in your time, in number of seconds you take. You key in 10. Can you just key in something? 10, 50, a number, right? And um, what happens is, <laughs> no, read the questions here. How many seconds you take to complete, right? And then it just pops up. People are engaging, right? There's a kind of interactions here. Okay, so you see what can do. You can use this break activity as a break here, right? So one last point here, right? Um, time is running out. Be more human. How to be more human? This is what students did here, right? As we present, they see us, they crop the screen and then do a meme of us. Okay, so this is my student, John is his name. And then <laughs> it's just don't take yourself seriously, okay? I, I'm not mad at him. My alarm is ringing, so I'm going to finish off soon. Um, summary is that you try to engage your audience by having some polls here, right? Different types of questions, MCQ, math. Standing is better than sitting. Uh, showing your full body is better than half body, than a webcam, than a no photo, and break out into sessions here. Be lively, okay? And the last thing that you didn't see is try to instill confidence and resilience in your people. And this is what you did to me, right? You see, you said, keep up the good work, right? Inspire me to continue better. So I just have to thank my team here, you know, all my colleagues and students in my team, they are very united in this, even though we're staying at home here. And together, we'll overcome COVID-19 together, right? Because everybody is here in the whole world, right? Together in this. And so I thank you for your time. Stay healthy and safe. See you later. Thank you very much, uh, Farman, for the very interesting talk on how, on how we can engage with the uh, with the media and the different teaching teaching learning uh, strategies to uh, to convey the the audience. So since we are a bit delayed uh, uh, on time, so I will ask the the audience um, uh, to please uh, um, uh, make your questions in the chat. Direct them to the speakers. And then we'll uh, compile and bring them to the discussion at the end we are, while we are going through the panel discussion. So please stay at the end, not only the, this the next week's speaker, but it will be really uh, very interesting to, to, uh, to listen to the, all the speakers and to engage, engage with them in the, in the panel uh, discussion. So uh, um, I would like now to, um, to move on. And the, the, the next speaker uh, uh, will be uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Emma Pusey. So uh, Emma is a, has a PhD in material science from University of Cambridge, uh, UK. And uh, then due, she's, uh, due to her interest in the science writing and the publishing, she has uh, joined a career um, uh, at uh, ULife, that is an open access, uh, open access uh, journal, in which uh, she was writing some articles, uh, focusing on, uh, on research published by the journal itself, across the life science, but also uh, some articles focusing on the early career researchers and the several uh, hurdles that they face while uh, going through the, uh, her journey in academia. So currently, she's the comment and career editor at Chemistry World, uh, and she's writing uh, um, and editing several news articles um, about research life culture, science careers, how to keep mental health, and much more. So you can you can really see through the uh, website at Chemistry World, and uh, so with this I am really very pleased to welcome uh, uh, Emma, um, and she will be talking about uh, how to maintain a healthy work-life uh, balance while uh, working remotely from uh, from home. Please, Emma. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Let me just uh, get my screen up. Let's hope we get this right. Right, is that sharing? Yeah. Cool, lovely. So yes, um, so normally I'm um, based in the RSE's uh, Cambridge office, 
Um, but that's been closed for three weeks now and is expected to remain closed until at least uh, the end of May. Uh, more widely throughout the UK at the moment, unless you're a key worker who can't work from home and whose work is essential to keeping the country running, we're only supposed to leave home to go to the shops and we're also allowed out uh, once a day for exercise. So I've been working at home now for the last three weeks and although I've worked from home for the odd day here and there in the past, this has been a very different experience. The first point I want to emphasise is that this is not a normal working from home situation. Uh, my partner has worked from home full time for the last three years and even he has had to make extra adjustments and adaptations uh, to help get him through the day. Uh, his problem has been um, the first point on my list here, switching off from work. It's very easy to sort of get stuck in a sort of working mentality all day if you're in the same place all the time. You can't go out and break out of um, that kind of uh, environment. So I'll talk about a little bit about that today. Another problem you might have um, is having your personal life uh, getting in the way of the time that you would normally have set aside to work. Um, particularly um, if you have children and you're having to take over childcare because schools and childcare centres have now closed. I also want to talk a little bit today about uh, healthy working practices. Also, a few healthy non-working practices if you're sort of struggling to adjust to uh, the evening after work. Before I get started um, properly on, on the advice I have gathered, I want to emphasise everything I say today is a suggestion, not an ideal to live up to. And this applies to all the advice you might find in other places as well. We all have very different living situations and there's no one magic solution that we can all use to make our lives better. If you think a tip will help you, give it a try. And if it doesn't work, move on and try something else. It's not that you've failed to apply the tip correctly, it's just that it isn't right for your situation. Right, so the most important thing about working from home or anywhere is to be comfortable. Um, working from home, you're probably going to be doing a lot of working in front of a computer screen. So you need to find a way of um, sitting or standing that doesn't put any undue strain on your muscles. Um, in the uh, picture here, you can see there's sort of standard viewing angles and uh, angles for you to have your joints at that are supposed to help reduce your, your um, sort of the strain on your body. And if you sort of have a Google for like good working posture, you can find some of these. Obviously, it's going to be more difficult um, to achieve these kind of angles if you don't have a full office setup. But there's still things you can do um, to help with that. It's really it's about trying to trying the best you can to replicate a comfortable position. Um, if you can, if you can afford to buy a little bit of equipment, it's worth it to preserve your health. Otherwise, get creative. Um, books are very handy, um, either to stack up as a footrest or to uh, adjust the height of your screen. That's good. I've seen some really nice standing desks made out of your kitchen countertop with some books on top to allow us to give you a bit more moving around. I also recommend um, contacting the occupational health department at your institution or employer as they might be able to provide you with some equipment or at least some advice that will be able to help you out. The other really important thing to do while you work from home is to take regular breaks to stretch, move around and rest your eyes on something that isn't a computer screen. You have permission to wander off now and do that if you need to. Um, in general, they recommend sort of breaks at least every hour, every half hour is better for five minutes. Um, there are apps and websites again that you can use to help you keep track of these breaks. Although uh, the problem I've always had with setting alarms is it's very easy to dismiss them. Um, so I have tried to find other ways to force me to leave. So my way is um, I drink a lot of water throughout the day. So I started drinking out of smaller, a small wine glass to make sure it more uh, frequent for me to have to get up and top up. Right. Choosing where to work. This is also important. So I work for my conservatory. It's quite nice. It's isolated from the rest of the house. It has natural light. Um, but that's very lucky that you know I may have a spare room in which I can set up. If you have one that's great but that's not possible for everyone. Maybe you only have one room in your apartment or only one comfortable spot to sit in. If that's the case for you there's still things you can do to kind of break up the sort of the monotony of being in the same place all day. First of all highly recommend when you're done for the day 
pack up all your working things, stick it in a bag, stick it in a box, put it at the back of the cupboard where you can't see it. So that it is out of your mind. Um, if you are using the same computer to work and relax from, shut down all of your work related windows. You know, at the very least, if you don't want to close down all those tabs you've got saved up, use a different browser to look at your, you know, fun videos or whatever it is you're doing. Um, secondly, try making small changes in your environment that just give you a little bit of a change. So it could be sitting in a different spot in the room. Um, you might, if you're very adventurous, you might want to try shifting the furniture around, having a work setup and a home setup, or even just something smaller like putting a, a different poster on the wall to look at while you're working. The physical activity of then changing the room back um, at the end of the day will also help give you a little bit of a mental break to help you switch into relaxation mode at the end of the day. If you can't change your room, um, you can try um, smaller things, so uh, a work cup that you only drink out of when you're working, perhaps. Or uh, changing your clothes can be quite a good way to almost subconsciously make you feel like you're in a working mood. Doesn't necessarily mean putting on formal work clothing, maybe it's just a different jumper. Um, but one bit of advice from one of my colleagues is um, you can try putting on shoes or slippers with a hard sole. That helps you feel a bit more formal and a more professional frame of mind. And you also get to then kick them off at the end of the day when you're relaxing. Another important thing when you're working from home is to try and set a routine or give your day some structure so you know when you're working, and when you're not working. It's natural at first to try and follow a similar routine to the one you had when you were heading out to the lab or office to work. But unless there's a specific reason why you need to stick to those exact hours, it's worth experimenting a bit to find a pattern that works better for you. It could be some small change like starting and finishing half an hour earlier in the day. Or you might want to take a break in the middle of the day and then work uh, more in the evenings. Don't feel you have to have the same routine every day either. I don't know about you, but I'm sort of starting to lose track of which day of the week it is at the moment. So you could have a sort of a, I don't know, a late lunch Wednesday, for example, just to give you a bit of difference and help you keep track of how everything's going. Leave room as well in your time schedule for a sponta spontaneity. Um, if it's a lovely day outside and you want to go out for a run, go for a run um, and then just catch up with work later on. And as any uh, new routine or schedule will take a little bit of time to adjust to, but if you've tried it for a few days and it's not working for you, you know, don't worry about it. Again, it's not a failure. It's just not working for you right now. So try something new and maybe you'll find you know, a really fun new way to work. While we're on the subject of uh, routine, I'll talk a little bit about uh, childcare. As I know, this is an issue that many people are having now that schools are closing. Um, I don't have children myself, but many of my colleagues have young children. So I've asked them for some of their tips on how they're managing at the moment. Because they all seem to do a great job. And, also, and um, as Funman said, it's really nice. Um, occasionally you will see a child pop up in one of our Zoom meetings. And it's always nice to see a bit of uh, home life uh, coming into work. But in general, try to keep things separate as a bit of advice. So work, try not to try to separate your time into separate blocks. So you might have a short block to do work in and then a short block where you're doing childcare rather than mixing the two and sort of not really concentrating fully on either. And focus on the positives of this as well. While you know, it is going to be difficult, um, you will probably have to be doing some workings or when the children are asleep to catch up with things. And there are also advantages. Uh, to having your day sort of broken into small chunks. One of my colleagues uh, says that she's become more efficient when working because she has to have, have laser-like focus on those brief moments where she does have time to work during the day. And of course, you also had the benefit of spending more time with your children and enjoying time with them. Much like setting routine, setting a timetable is a really helpful thing to do so the children know when they're supposed to be doing things. And that kind of also reduces, um, you know, it saves you time making decisions or having to argue about what's going to happen next. And also, if you're sharing childcare duties with someone, it makes it easier to hand over when the other person left off. Uh, but within that recommendation, one of my colleagues has said that he tells his children that um, while they need to do a certain number of things a day, it doesn't matter when they do it, but they still have some control over uh, their own lives and what they do. And as for uh, what to do with them, uh, lots of crafts is apparently really good fun and also educational. There are also loads of videos online um, here in the UK. There's a big thing about uh, Joe Wicks PE lessons. Um, 
Khan Academy Kids has some great um, courses for kids under the age of seven. Yeah, and it also just gives the children time to just blow off steam, running around and uh, c c calming down a little bit as well. Right, so whether you have children or not, at some point you're going to end your working day. Excellent. Uh, it can be difficult to have that, you know, really feel like you've ended the day if you're staying in the same place all the time. Um, but there's a few things you can do to help that. The first one is try to stick to your planned end time. This is something that actually I've been really bad at recently. You think, oh, I'll just finish one more thing. And particularly as you're switching over to working from home, it's easy to feel like you haven't been as productive as you normally would be. Um, probably because you haven't been as productive. Um, it takes time to adjust to a new schedule. And it also takes longer to communicate with people when you're not in the room with them. And remember as well, you may not be working the same hours anymore, so that might be slowing down your projects. But that, you know, do not feel guilty about that. That is absolutely fine. And that's the situation that we're all in. And that's why though, you want to be really strict on sort of end time and making sure that you are making time to you know, relax at the end of the day as well. Uh, turn off your notifications. If any, you have any notifications still, like work related notifications popping up in your personal things, please, please, please take the time now uh, to switch them off. Because as I said, people are going to be working flexible hours. They're going to, you know, someone might be working, your colleague might be working at 10 o'clock at night. It doesn't mean you have to respond to them when they message you if you've decided your working day ends at 6 p.m. And then, as for the transition itself, I find it really helps to do something physical to shake out a work mode, whether that's, you know, restoring your room to how it normally looks if you've been doing a nice work setup, or just something small like getting up, looking out the window. Um, if you're allowed outside, doing some exercise and going for a nice walk. Um, if um, uh, else, yeah. if um, you're really kind of struggling with the transition, you can treat it almost as the start of a new day. And if you need to, just go into your morning routine again. You know, have a shower, change your clothes, have breakfast. You can even start with a nap if you like. Just something that sort of triggers you to think, okay, I've done with work now. This is a separate part of my life. Okay, and then finally, I just want to say a little bit about what you can do in your free time. Uh, well, some of you might have wall-to-wall -wall activities planned. For others, uh, particularly if you're used to spending a lot of time out of the house, you can find yourself at a bit of a loose end. And at those times, it's easy for worries to start creeping in because you know we're living in a very worrying situation at the moment. One of the reasons why it's important to spend time away from work is to look after your mental health. And if you are struggling, please don't hesitate to reach out to friends, family, or mental health professionals for support. It's easy to think of working from home at the moment as being a bit of a break or maybe even a holiday from your normal routine. If that's how you see it, that's great. But the way I've been thinking about it in the current pandemic situation is that it's more like you know, when you've been ill and you're still not quite back up to full health, but you can sort of do most of your activities that you normally get up to. So think of this as a time to recuperate. Um, exercise is really good for sort of helping you refresh your mind and help you feel good. You know, I actually hate exercise, but I am having to admit to myself that yes, I do feel better after I've done it. And there's lots you can do inside and again, again, apps and uh, lots of exercise videos on YouTube that you, know, you don't need equipment to do, just do a bit of yoga or whatever you fancy. Um, Socialising as well, um, use video calls where you can for that extra uh, bit of human connection. I've replaced trips to the pub with some Zoom calls with friends. And at work as well, we have tea breaks over Zoom. Um, and for avoidance of all doubt, uh, socialising with colleagues does count as work. It just makes up for the time when you'd be chatting with them in day in person. Uh, if you're living with someone, you might also want to block out some time alone as you know, being around them 24 seven can get a little bit intense. Uh, if you are worrying about things, try to focus on the things that you can do something about and then you know, try your best to motivate yourself to do it. And as hopefully this is a reasonably short term thing, the worries you can't do anything about, just try and find a distraction. And your distraction can be anything, anything that gives you pleasure. You know, dance around your kitchen, lie in bed watching Netflix, knit the world's most awesome hat, you know, whatever brings you relaxation or joy. Don't fall into the trap of comparing yourself to other people. 
it's easy to look on uh, social media and see all the amazing baking people have done and think, ah, no, I haven't achieved anything today. But you know, that's not what staying indoors at the moment is about. It's not about competing with people. It's about staying healthy, keeping yourself healthy and keeping everyone else healthy as well. So I'd just like to finish with three final messages. Do the best you can, do what works best for you and focus on the positives. And uh, this picture is my attempt to make a meringue the other day. You could choose to see it as a failed meringue, but you know, making it was fun and it tasted quite nice. So I'm gonna call it success. And I hope that you're able to look for all the positives in your days as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma, for these quite interesting talks. So nowadays, more than ever, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to um, um, keep on uh, separating our personal to, uh, from our personal, uh, uh, from uh, our, our personal and professional life. So these are really very nice insights and tips on how people can keep uh, on uh, um, having uh, uh, their own uh, uh, work and, uh, and personal life uh, separately uh, while working uh, from home. So thank you very much. So um, again, uh, all questions to uh, to Emma. Uh, I would like to ask you to um, to put them uh, in the chat, and um, um, so that we can handle them uh, uh, at the panel uh, discussion. Um, so um, now I would like to uh, uh, introduce our uh, uh, final speaker of this uh, session before the panel discussion again. So uh, the next speaker will be uh, uh, Dr. Fernando Gamalion Bell. Uh, Fernando holds a PhD in organic chemistry and is also an expert in science communication. He has been uh, writing several articles for uh, uh, multiple magazines, uh, uh, such as uh, CNN, uh, it is a magazine from uh, uh, ACS as well as Chemistry World from uh, RSC, and is also co hosting several uh, science TV shows targeting the, the general public. Uh, moreover, Fernando is also a former uh, chair of uh, UICN and uh, uh, one of the founders of uh, IYCN. So, uh, owing to its, uh, uh, his extensive experience in science communication, he is currently the press and communications coordinator of Graphene flagship project. Uh, so, he's one of the biggest uh, uh, in Europe projects uh, in Europe. And uh, uh, Fernando uh, will share uh, today with us um, um, strategies and some advice on how to effectively communicate chemistry in a creative uh, manner. Fernando, uh, please uh, go ahead with your talk. Fernando? Hello, can you see my presentation now? Yes. Um, that's that's the presenter view, Fernando. That's the wrong one. The, there you go. You'll be able to okay. see it now, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah, for a very kind introduction, and thank you, uh, Laurie and Antonio, for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm trying to do an engaging presentation in a webinar. I noted some of uh, Funman's tips, but I probably won't do it as good as 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 he did. Uh, although I will show my human side, uh, I'm not as dressed up as the rest of the people. And you may see my cats coming around here uh, at some point. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. That's that's my human side. And then uh, I also try to keep hydrated and have my tea every now and then, following Emma's, Emma's advice, because uh, otherwise we may all go crazy in this situation. That, um, like Emma said, it's not a normal situation. It's not uh, working from home. It's just we have to be at home working during a crisis. And it's not uh, it's not normal. We have to get used to this. So here are some ideas, some tips on how to try to have some fun uh, during this uh, quarantine period, during this lockdown, and how to uh, at the same time try to communicate our chemistry effectively. Because maybe we don't get the chance to communicate what we do. We don't get the chance to go to conferences. So here are some uh, tips on on how to do that effectively. I already thank uh, the organizing committee for inviting me here, but I always like to introduce my presentation with this big thank you uh, gift. Um, so I really don't know what your background is uh, for the people listening to this webinar, but uh, you probably are uh, either a bachelor in chemistry, masters or PhD in chemistry. You must know that what you learn in your career, what you learn um, in the lab, what you learn in the chemistry books, 
can be very useful uh, for other skills and you can actually transfer that and you can actually use it for a whole variety of applications. And I'm actually gonna show you some examples in this short presentation today of how you can use uh, the tools that you've got at home, like a computer or a mobile phone to do some really, really exciting communication and to get others excited about chemistry and, and science in general. Because like, like you know, uh, normally people think that uh, what you do, what you do in chemistry, what you do in science uh, stops when you publish a science paper. So you've got your research in the lab, you do your experiments, uh, then you put together your analysis and your paper, you publish it, uh, and then what? Then you need to tell the public about it, then you need to tell others about it, and it's it's sometimes it's not easy uh, if you have to be locked in your house, but there's ways to do it. You don't need to go to an ACS conference to share your research. There's very, very interesting ways to do it online. And I'm gonna show you uh, some, some ideas. And it, this is not uh, anything new. Um, this, has been, been, uh, this has been done since like a while back. Uh, today, we couldn't be uh, like Michael Faraday in a room full of people because most of our countries are in lockdown. But uh, you can find some tools to do interesting uh, communication of chemistry concepts and your papers and your science uh, today. I just want to give you a very, very broad and very, very general tip. Uh, you need to think uh, creatively. You need to think out of the box and kind of have in mind that any idea that you have, any idea that you have to communicate your science is valid. If you haven't watched this series of videos, they're amazing. You can look them up in, in YouTube. They're called uh, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Uh, they're a bit crazy, but I'm sure you have a lot of spare time these days. So just uh, maybe like a fun thing to do, as Emma was saying before, uh, just grab a cup of tea and watch them uh, tonight before dinner to zone out from, from all your work. So many ideas here. Uh, you could do communication of chemistry using Poetry, for example. Uh, here's a very good example from a guy called uh, Justin Brower, uh, who tweeted about poisons from like all the letters of the alphabet from A to Z. Um, and it's, it's quite amazing. He tweeted a picture of the structure and then he composed a poem for each of these molecules, which I think it's a very, very clever way and very creative way to disseminate chemistry and make people aware of, of about chemistry and, and poisons out there in nature. Because of course, not, not everything that's uh, natural is, is good. There's poisons out there that are very, very dangerous. Um, you are at home, but you can still use your phone to send tweets and you can use your phone to send messages to your friends. And I think it's a very interesting uh, idea to share some of chemistry concepts using emojis. I, I'm sure you've noticed a lot of people using uh, like the wash your hands emoji on, on WhatsApp or Twitter in their, in their name. Uh, they also use the soap emoji as wash your hands with soap. And this is a very original example that I love from, from Nicola Gaston who, who did a whole periodic table of elements uh, using emojis. Um, you can see like some of them are very, very clever like the croissant for francium. I love that one. Um, if you have an artsy side, um, you can also disseminate chemistry and science uh, through pictures and drawings. Uh, and again, you're gonna have a lot of free time or time that before you didn't have, you were spending on your commute, you were spending, you know, staying extra hours in the lab, now you're at home. So maybe you can kind of develop this artsy side and find a way to communicate what you do to communicate science uh, through art. Uh, this like, I'm showing like a very, very nice cover of Nature Chemistry that a friend of mine uh, did for a paper on MOF. Uh, I think it's it's a lovely cover. And then at the right, I'm showing uh, some original stickers from uh, a lady named Sydney that I follow on Twitter. You've got her uh, Twitter profile there in my presentation. And I think uh, she has like a very, very particular style. And I mean, the, the illustrations are lovely and she sells them as, as stickers if you have that, that side. I also saw someone doing uh, crochet uh, structures of like labware and I think they're amazing so just I mean find the time and communicate chemistry through through art and then now I, I wanted to show you some real examples uh, from from the situation right now like from 
uh, people that have been communicating chemistry during the actual COVID crisis. So this is an example from the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, who are doing a series of quizzes about the chemical elements. And I think they're really, really engaging because they just give you one hint. Uh, and then after an hour, they give you another hint. And then they keep giving hints for like three, four hours in the afternoon. So after you like finish working, and then you, you have this uh, poll uh, happening that you can actually, uh, you know, give your opinion on which, ups, which is the, the element they're talking about, like this one, you know, they were giving clues with Harry Potter and everything. It, it, it's really cool. So I, I encourage you to follow the Rosetti of Chemistry and the hashtag RSC quiz. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, a, it's an interesting way of, of, you know, disseminating chemistry these days. Another one comes from where I work now. Like uh, Shoao said, I currently work in the Graphene flagship, which is a big uh, European uh, project on graphene. And recently we had to switch our entire, one of our conferences, we had to switch it completely to our virtual world because we couldn't, uh, we couldn't run it in person. It was supposed to happen in Italy. And of course we had to cancel that because Italy is one of the big centers of this uh, pandemic. So, we found a uh, new way to do it online and we found this virtual platform that kind of looks like uh, The Sims, like the game. And it was actually quite uh, successful. We had a lot of people joining and you can go to our website, just go to graphingflagship.eu and you can read the experience that a lot of uh, the people joining the conference had. And it was quite positive. So we may find new ways to, to do this. You can also, you know, uh, like Andy Browning does, uh, share your knowledge of chemistry on how to fight this this is how to fight this virus and if you come i saw the map that uh Fonman put at the beginning if you come from different parts of the world you can actually help in this crisis you can write to andy and he normally doesn't do translations of his graphics but in this case for COVID, he's doing a lot of them so if you speak a language uh for which this uh graphics have not been done go ahead uh talk to andy reach him out on on Twitter and he'll be glad to send you a link to a Google form where you can help translate these graphics so they are available in your language. You may need your chemistry knowledge and you know your your language knowledge to like put that together and bring out some some really interesting information for your population. I did uh, some translations into Spanish myself with with the help of my partner and and some of them were picked up by really really good uh, media outlets in Spain so I will encourage you to, to do this. Choose where you want to do your communication. There are many, many channels. I, I was just on Twitter like an hour ago and there was like a brilliant uh, video, like a brilliant TikTok video of, of how to disseminate chemistry. So find where you want to do it. And I would say like almost any platform is valid. Just go ahead and, and try to find the right platform for you. Uh, there's many ways to communicate chemistry, many places, um, and you can, you can really be original and you know be creative in this time find a story that, that can be interesting for other people, like, uh, you know, find the quizzes for elements or maybe stories that are related to, to the virus or maybe something else so people can disconnect a little bit from all this craziness. Uh, and, you know, finding the right story and the right thing to, to tell actually helps and a lot of people would get interested. And then maybe you can actually get some uh, positive things out of this, because uh, if you're more, you know, well-known on social media, you can actually get more citations you can actually become more known in your community and this could actually you know from a kind of selfish point of view really impact your your you know uh your online presence and then maybe you could have more more impact with your with your chemistry with the work you do in your lab i think it could be really really nice again uh communicating is something that we do because we we, we all do it we all do it in our everyday lives um in my case i did because i i love Science, I love chemistry and I love to tell the world, like, like you know, kind of paraphrasing Carl Sagan. But um, I think in this case, communication is very important. Like Emma was saying just a minute ago, it's super important to keep up the Skype with your friends, the calls with your friends. So, you know, communicating about what you do and how chemistry can help fight this crisis and find the vaccine and find the cure. I think it's important and we really need this in the, in the future. Uh, it's never too late. It's never too late to start doing this. It's never too late to start doing social media. Uh, Sir Fraser Stoddard joined Twitter after receiving his Nobel Prize. Uh, I don't know how old he was at the time, but you know, it's never too late to join uh, 
social media and start communicating uh, and trying to trying to share the message and your love for, for chemistry. Just explore the world out there, um, learn on the go, and you know, be confident that you can actually go out there, deliver your message, and you can you can succeed. Again, every little help helps. If you if you can translate one of Andy's graphics, it's amazing. If you come up with an idea for a quiz, email the RSE, maybe they, they want new ideas. If you want to, you know, write for chemistry world, I'm sure that Emma will be you know, willing to read your, your ideas and your, your pitches. So just, you know, do whatever you do best and, and go ahead and try to do it and communicate the chemistry because that's, we need communication in this, this times of, of crisis and we need to talk to other people. And, and we need to try to do it creatively because, you know, we need new ways of communicating like this webinar in, in times of, of crisis. So I hope uh, that it was on time, Joao. Uh, I guess we'll be answering the questions later today in the in the panel but thank you so much again for your invitation if you have any questions or follow-up or whatever you can uh, always reach me on twitter uh that's my username and i think this is being recorded but if you want the presentation just drop me a, a direct message and i can send you the slides no problem at all thank you so much for for your attention thank you very much fernando for the great talk it's indeed very important to um, to be uh, creative and um, um and uh, um, indeed, if you we have really have to know how to communicate. If you don't communicate well, we cannot pass the message to the to the audience, and that that quite uh, means as well that we don't really understand what we are talking about. So it's really important. And uh, thank you so much for this uh, insightful uh, uh, um, advice. So before going into the panel discussion, uh, I would like just to highlight that there is a module on promoting mental health that is being promoted by the Northeastern University that you can find at resilience-ed.org. And there you can find a lot of science-based information, really very nice modules and short courses that you can take on and uh, on how to wash your hands, uh, how to keep engaged with, uh, with the media, how to disinfect your surface, how to take care of your mental health. So very nice uh, course that uh, really uh, um, advise you to take on. So um, now we have reached to the uh, panel discussion and uh, we thank again all the speakers that have been speaking previously. And uh, besides them, we'll have uh, Professor Alisa Lincoln and Professor uh, uh, Jen Imstra that will be joining us. Um, so uh, Alisa is of the, um, a master uh, uh, in public uh, uh, health. And, um, um, and she's an associated dean of research in the College of Social Science and Humanities, director of the Institute for Health Equity and Social Justice Research, and professor of sociology and health science at the Northeastern University at US. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Jen Imstra is uh, currently a professor, associate professor of chemistry at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. And uh, um, besides being a professor, she is uh, a researcher and mentor, providing daily advice to early uh, stage and the postdoc researchers through Twitter, CNN, among other search. I am uh, sure that you have seen a lot uh, uh, insightful advice for the uh, Twitter account. And uh, I would like also to welcome to the panel discussion uh, my colleague uh, Sebastian Weber. He's a social media chair at uh, IYCN. And uh, from now on, he will, uh, he will guide this uh, discussion. Sebastian, please. So, also welcome to everybody from my side and thanks to the previous speakers. It's now my pleasure to guide you through this panel discussion. Um, we would rather focus on, on the general topic here. Um, first, before we start with some uh, questions directly to the previous three speakers. And the first question I would like to raise to, to the whole panelists, because I guess it's a situation that uh, affects them all is, um, at the moment, have you tried out some new working techniques or are you used to work at home? And are you used to work in a digital environment? Um, in your daily life, or was that at the moment something new to you? So I think we can start there maybe with Eliza. Did you mean me, Elisa? Yes. Oh, great. So yeah, so um, I just wanted to start by saying I've been 
uh, hovering quietly in the background listening to all of you. And I'm so glad I did because um, I'm incredibly inspired by all of the ways you are thinking about taking care of yourselves and the creative ways you're thinking about communicating. As you can tell from my bio, I'm a sociologist and a public health person. I don't actually know a whole lot about chemists and chemistry, um, but I feel like I learned a tremendous amount from all of you just from listening in. Um, so I'm really, really honored and pleased that you asked me to join. Um, and in terms of you know, working from home, um, and, and I think some people touched on this, I, I think it's actually incredibly important at this moment to realize um, this is not, as, as I think Emma said, not just working from home. And one of the things um, that I keep trying to uh, uh, add into conversations about this is that all of us have taken on increasing caregiving in this moment, whether it's for ourselves during this stressful time or whether there are people around us in our communities who are already unwell, uh, kids, care, uh, parents, neighbors, um, and all of that is significant effort and work. And um, you know, we have to count that labor as we think about our days. Um, I've had a number of people say to me, you know, why is it so much more exhausting to work from home? And I think some of that is the lack of, of physical social connection, um, despite the efforts to do things like this. But some of it is all of these other tasks that I don't think we're all consciously counting, right? Helping neighbors with groceries and prescriptions or having, you know, kids run through our Skype calls. So um, I think that would be what I would add here and then see what others have to say. Thank you for this. Uh... Quite summarizing answer, I would directly hand the word over to Jen that you maybe follow up on that. Sure, yeah, I completely agree about, um, you know, this isn't your average like work from home situation, you know, as, as a graduate student, you know, there's a really big difference between, you know, what you're being called to do now, which is like suddenly and unexpectedly shut down your research versus the like, oh, I'm going to work from home for a few weeks to, you know, write my thesis as I'm nearing the end of my PhD. Um, and, and just to add on that, on top of, you know, all of the kind of extra caregiving, there's just a, you know, something I'm coming to realize is that there's just kind of like a mental and emotional tax that, um, you know, none of us can really quantify or even think about how to expect, you know, we've never lived through a situation like this before. And, um, you know, the uncertainty that surrounds it, the, you know, worrying about, the health of those around us, our own health, uh, the impact economically on our communities, on, on people we care about um, who have small businesses. I think, um, you know, we have to realize that, you know, we can't even anticipate how how we might respond to this emotionally. And, and you know, if you feel like, oh, I'm just not quite myself, you know, that's, that's kind of a normal in this time. Um, you know, I will say kind of on, on the positive side with coping, um, you know, something that I love that my group has started doing is we kind of have like a Slack channel where we're sharing, you know, work, work from home tips because it's really, you know, nothing, there's no one size fits all. It's all about who you are as a person and how you work and what your preferences are. And, um, you know, but it's, it's really about experimenting and kind of, you know, if there is something to be gained in all of this, it's maybe some, you know, some self-discovery about, you know, learning how you deal with stress, learning about how you cope, um, you know, learning about how you adapt to a new work environment and what is most effective for you. Um, and, and then trying to find, you know, some, some good or some kind of self-discovery there that you can use. You know, hopefully we don't have another global pandemic in our lifetime, but, you know, the next time there's something adverse that you have to deal with, something unexpected, you know, maybe it's an opportunity to kind of you know yourself a little bit better and, and know what's going to work for you. Thank you very much for this answer. Does any of the other panelists have to add something on that? If that's not the case, then I would directly start now with the first, uh, first questions from the audience. And there was a question from Bianca David. Um, has anybody of you an advice uh, what students who should give their PhD defense virtually should do for preparation right now? So I will just jump in. I'm sure others have comments as well. We've done a couple virtual uh, defenses in the past two weeks, um, and we've advised students to prepare just as they would for their in-person defenses, to set up practice presentations with friends and colleagues, um, and to run through it several times before joining, both for the technology, but also all of the same rules apply around technology. 
Uh, the other thing that we've really stressed is really thinking about taking care of your own well-being during the time. Um, and so, as, as Jen pointed out, you know, it's hard for us to individually assess the increase in stress, but we do know in some early data coming out in the U.S. that um, on a population level, there have been huge spikes in stress and distress, disruption of sleep, disruption of daily life. Um, and so trying to figure out how to uh, schedule a defense in a way that allows you to feel that you're sort of at your best that day. So if you're a morning person or an afternoon person and, and um, also remembering to work with your committee where there's, I, I don't, I'm assuming for most of you this is true, there's a bit more flexibility in how we schedule these things right now. I hope the question was answered or has anybody of the panelists have something to add? Yeah, Jen? Um, yeah, I, I echo all of that, that, yeah, you don't want the, you know, 10 minutes before your defense to be when you're figuring out the technology and how to not get the echo in the room and, and all of those different things. And it's, that's challenging. Um, but, you know, I think enough people have done it now that even social media kind of getting to what uh, Fernando was saying about the power of social media, it's, it's a great place to um, get out there and get advice from other people on what worked for them. You know, if they wanted to be sitting in front of their computer or some people, you know, one person I know kind of had their computer set up and they had a laser pointer that they could use kind of on their computer screen. So it felt a lot more like being in front of a, a projector screen. Um, and, and I just wanted to add that, um, you know, thinking kind of to the side of processing kind of the loss of, of the experience of having an in-person thesis defense. Um, you know, it's okay to feel really bummed about that. You know, it's it's not selfish, okay. you know, like if, if you're feeling like, oh man, the world, you know, people are in hospitals and dying and I'm feeling bad about my thesis defense. Like there's no, um, you know, kind of Brene Brown says, there's enough empathy for everyone and, and this whole comparative suffering thing doesn't have to happen. You know, that's, that's a loss of an experience. You know, you've worked really hard for, you know, five or so years in order to be at this moment where uh, you get to celebrate all of those accomplishments and, um, you know, and you kind of have that, you know, expectation of what that experience is going to be like. And and now there's a loss that happened because you're not going to get to have that experience that you had planned to have. And it's it's healthy and completely normal to, you know, kind of go through almost like a mourning process of being upset, being angry, um, and, and hopefully coming around to kind of acceptance on that. Um, but then also I think it's uh, it's easy, I think for all of us to feel like this is just going to go on forever. You know, there's like a cognitive bias towards thinking however it is now is how it will be forever. Um, and, and maybe something healthy is to plan for something you can look forward to in the future of saying, well, okay, I won't get to have that moment where we all go back to the lab office and pop the champagne and celebrate together. Um, but maybe I'll plan something online with my friends right now, and then I'm going to plan something for in the future that will be an in-person get-together that might kind of look or feel um, a little bit, you know, even if it's just with your family, you know, if you're traveling away for a job or a postdoc, you might not be able to have quite the same thing, but kind of plan some sort of an in-person gathering that you can look forward to that will be a little bit more of what you'd hope to have. Thank you very much for this answer. Any of the other three has something to add there? If Fanman, yes. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I echo um, what Elisa and Jen talked about. I think it's very good advice. Um, I thought that, uh, you know, even when a PhD is doing defense or a presentation through a camera, it's very hard to imagine human beings. So I suggest that if you are in your room or in your house, you can on the table put some photos of your loved ones, your friends there. You know, there are humans supporting you here that depend on you, even your cat, you know, you feel more livelier than just looking at the date screen. And um, if it's possible, the technology get it resolved before you do it, practice more through the camera. And I think that, you know, do it like if COVID-19 wasn't here, that means right, oh, you have a screen behind you, if you can afford a TV, you know, just do it very naturally and stand up. And It'd be very empowering for you. Just a little bit of it. I guess that's a definitely a helpful answer there. We would go on then with another question from Alexandros um, to Fernando, but I guess we can also raise this question to the whole audience. Um, do you have any tips on communicating science at the moment mm -hmm. to the general population? So mainly to prevent or to fight fake news? Um, yeah, it's 
it's a very hard time to communicate science because I mean the news on COVID are changing every day. Like just two days ago, the virus didn't spread through the air and now it does and then it doesn't. It's like the evidence is changing every day. The same with like drugs for treatments. Uh, so we need to be really careful and we really need to listen to the right experts uh, in this field, in the fields of epidemics and the fields of, you know, pharma, not any expert is okay for, for this for this crisis. Um, and that's why we, you know, need to be really, really careful at what we communicate, try to be really uh, truthful. I mean, always, we always have to do that. But in this case, we need to be especially careful trying to deliver the right, the right message. But then again, as scientists, we probably know a bit more about how the virus works, how biology works, why we need to stay at home. So in that aspect, I try to explain that to your friends, to your loved ones as much as possible and as well as you can. Something as simple as explain why soap works to destroy the virus, that's chemistry and it's basic chemistry. And I've done that for like newspapers, TV, uh, do that. Like explain that, that just simple drop of soap is enough to exterminate the virus. And that's because of chemistry, because of the fatty layer, and they will understand. And it, it's really, I mean, you can do something communicating the chemistry, and but especially be very careful because fake news are as serious in this case, and we need to avoid them. And we need to be serious about this pandemic that may go on for a long time if we don't stay at home and take it really seriously. Okay, thank you very much for this answer. Fernando, then we would have a question for Emma by Giovanna. And she has a question whether you are familiar with any research on the importance of physically separating different aspects of working day when you're working from home. Well, I don't know any research, actually. Um, I'd be happy to look it up and uh, see what there is. Okay, thank you for this uh, short and, and uh, short and concise answer. And then we would have from from Giovanna a follow up question as well on on Jen, and this is then you have been actively sharing advice with the community with incredible energy and engagement even before the pandemic, and this does not seem to have changed. And what is your main advice for maintaining the drive and energy during this difficult time? Oh, wow. Um... Well, thank you for that. And I, um, it actually warms my heart to hear that it hasn't changed because I feel like I've, um, I've not been able to bring quite the same energy to it as I, as I always do, because I think, you know, we're all struggling a little bit, um, with what's going on. And, um, I think, you know, maybe my answer to that is, is if you can, you know, for some people I know getting off of social media has been their best coping strategy. Um, but for me, I found, you know, leaning into it has been a really great coping strategy. And so I think, um, you know, if, if you're excited to be engaged on social media, then, and you find it fulfilling, you should absolutely do that. And and some of that, or even just changing um, how you engage on social media. So I think a lot of us, well, I think pretty universally, we all want to uh, use our skills to impact the world for good, right? That's that's fundamentally what we all want to be able to do. And, you know, I think none of us here are, are medical professionals, so we can't be working in hospitals. You know, we're not epidemiologists. We're, you know, not people who can be, you know, out there running diagnostic tests. So we can't be doing any of those really practical things to help. And so for me, um, you know, I'll just say personally, it's it's been an opportunity to still say, okay, well, how how do I feel like I can still have a positive impact, even though I'm, you know, not not a doctor. And, um, you know, like for me, one of the ways that I have shifted is I don't normally do a lot of, you know, direct science communication where I talk about chemistry. Um, but I, I just found myself, you know, talking to friends and family who weren't scientists and trying to explain drugs, the drugs to them or trying to explain diagnostic testing. And as I was explaining it to them, you know, in a way that, you know, kind of people who don't have a PhD in science could, you know, really 
grasp the main concepts and, and understand it, I thought, oh gosh, I should just like hop on the internet and, and post this because, you know, maybe there'd be some use in that. And seeing how people responded to that, I realized, oh, this is a service I can provide hopefully to the community. I think we all, you know, Fernando talked about that in his talk that, you know, it's it's a way that you can be providing a service to the community by by putting information out there. And then that's that in itself can actually be a, a coping strategy. And um, if I can add one thing, um, Fernando gave such a great answer about um, kind of how to engage in this time of misinformation and some really great advice. I can't claim this advice. I got this at a, a workshop that I went to about science communication, but they said, you know, really um, be upfront about your expertise. Say like, okay, I, I can speak to this, but I can't speak to this. So I would say like, okay, I'm not an epidemiologist. I can't talk about whether these drugs are actually working. I can't really interpret clinical trials any better than any other citizen scientist, but I, I am a chemist. And so I can tell you about the mechanisms by which these work, so. I think that's a really great answer. Fernando, do you want to add something there? Just said that something really really insightful uh in fact i think one of the most i think one of the most like viral informations about covid and why soap eliminates it comes from a scientist who just shared a thread on twitter and ended up somehow on the new york times on the guardian and a lot of a lot of places so you know if you have information just go ahead and Okay, I think we lost a bit the audio of Fernando, but just continue. Um, we have a question from Emil um, that's mainly related to the talk of uh, Funman, but maybe the others also have experience on that. How would you tackle a digital workshop environment where you would supervise more groups that work on different subtopics? Um, okay, um, for that, right, um, there's some freeware online. Um, I may suggest using Zoom here because uh, without even a um, a uh, commercial account can have a 40 minute kind of session here and the good thing about zoom i've tried is the breakout session they can do so suppose you have a workshop that has three groups here as a host you can go and uh, into the different groups and listen to what they say and that's why it's very important to let all of them a bit unmute themselves and so show their faces that if possible uh the good thing is also because of a 40 minute session here and the time is just right then people go for a break and come back again so i've only tried zoom uh, maybe there are other possible applications or freeware that the other panelists could share or even yeah please feel free does somebody wants to add something on this if not then we have a question to eliza um what are some of the strategies that we can use to look after our mental health during this time at the moment? Um, that's a really uh, important and big question. I do think that the um, the module that you mentioned at the beginning that Northeastern does has some nice summary results. Um, I'm tell what the, the sort of work we've been doing uh, has been reminding people to draw on the strengths they already have first. So to think about all of the ways you take care of yourself uh, on times that are, are uh, more regular or more normal and think about how to adapt those for now. So, you know, a lot of us use exercise or nutrition or spending time with friends to take care of our mental health and well-being. And part of the problem with this moment is that many of those pathways are interrupted by the social disruption. Um, and so thinking creatively about how to adapt and some of, I mean, you all spoke about them in your um, presentations, right? Having happy hour online instead of going to the pub. Um, finding ways to exercise outside where you can still keep appropriate physical distancing at the, uh, six feet away, exercising inside. Um, I think a big one, and actually it relates to something Emma said, is, is structure to your day. There actually is a very uh, large research literature on the importance of structure for our mental health and well-being. And, and again, all this working at home is something that disrupts that. Um, so I am not, in, in uh, thinking about what Jen said, I am not a clinician. I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist and a sociologist, so I do not give clinical advice, but on a population level, we know that there are strategies that help. So some of us are getting up, taking showers, putting on work clothes, at least from the waist up, um, right? And, and sort of giving ourselves artificial structure. Um, I love that everybody smiled for that. It was nice to know it's not just me who's probably wearing sweatpants on the bottom, um, <laughs> right? But thinking about ways that that help us to feel that we've retained some of our routine, um, and especially if you've got other people in the home that you're trying to support as well, 
Um, the last thing I just want to say is that we also know that one in five of us were living with a pre-existing mental health challenge prior to COVID-19, um, you know, appearing for all of us. And, and I think that that is a population that we have not paid enough attention to. Um, so if there are 100 people on this call, 20 of us are going to kind of fall into that group. And, and for those folks, a lot of the things they've done to stay healthy also have been disrupted. So thinking about transitioning to virtual therapy, how to get, make sure you have adequate medication. Um, but the other, the flip side of that is really to think about the strength-based approach there, right? So there are those of us who have had times of tremendous uncertainty before, um, or have lived with high levels of anxiety before and have figured out strategies and coping ideas and techniques and skills that are useful to the general population in this moment. Um, and I, I think that's an important message to get out there, that it's not just that we have a group that's vulnerable, we have a group that may actually have lived experience and skills that would better all of us. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I guess that are some really good tips for everybody at the moment. And then we would come now in, due to time reasons to a last question, um, and that would be maybe from Jeanette. Um, which tools can be used to explain practical exercises in chemistry at the moment? Okay. So I guess that's mainly in the direction of Funmin. Um, okay, I'll take that first, and then maybe the rest can add on, um, other lecturers. Um, I thought that, you know, because labs close down, um, you can't do anything. Uh, if you have not recorded any lab videos yourself, uh, I believe there are many resources either on Instagram or even on Twitter or even on YouTube, right? There are videos recorded by different labs. What you can do as a teacher is, right, you should go and scout those, right, and then find something that looks similar and you find it's good video and then you think through the process. If, right, if you are really there to see the uh, experimental observation, what are the questions that you want students to see or even to answer? And then after that, you can draw some worksheets and questions and also maybe some, some uh, uh, responses. And then after that, uh, you might want to organize a class, either synchronous or asynchronous, uh, to let students to come together and watch this uh, video and then give them the worksheet. So the other way to do it is right. Um, if you play the video, you can either like teach live, uh, live. That means right. Imagine everybody is looking at the same uh, reaction in the lab, and they just talk as a teacher. Oh, what what is the error here? What did uh, it go right or wrong? And then let them to discuss in their own groups here. So again, it could be very interactive. Um, I've got a couple of questions or so that what are the platform to use? But I would like to say that is the platform is always okay. Any platform are very similar, but it is about the activity and how um you engage your students. The energy inside is very important. <laughs> Thank you very much for this this answer on this last question. With that, unfortunately, the time is now over for our panel discussion. But um, at the end, I would uh, really Sebastian, like to I think, I think I think Jen had a comment on this. If you... Jen, Jen, then one last comment quickly. Oh yeah, I'll just make it short. I just wanted to add in on top of what Funman said, uh, which I, I that's all fantastic advice, and um, that that you still can have labs, and then also realizing that um, you know, in addition to teaching content um, about chemistry, that one of the purposes of labs is just to teach students the process of doing science. And so there's there's still ways to teach that process via like experiments that they can do at home. You know, it doesn't have to use organic solvents. You know, we can think creatively about different reactions that they might be able to do in their kitchen or or just that process of kind of having a question, thinking about how to design an experiment and thinking about how to analyze data. So a lot of those learning outcomes we can still generate um, in different environments. Yes, thanks for this addition. I think that's really helpful. And maybe we can also link that directly to the experimental competition from IYCN that Joao introduced to you. So that might be an opportunity for you to take part in this. With that, um, we are then now at the end, um, right on time. I would really like to thank all the panelists um, for the advices. I think they are really helpful for all of us. And um, I'm not sure whether Javier wants to uh, continue at the end and say something to the audience. Yeah, yeah Sebastian, maybe just before before that, if I may. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, because I cannot share my camera. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the, the speakers. So we really have a great lineup of international speakers and panelists. Many thanks once, once again for all of you for all your availability and by for supporting this initiative. Really, I'm really very pleased to, to have you uh, with us supporting these initiatives. 
and thank you as well for this very engaging uh, discussion. Um, so before reaching to the final uh, uh, words, I would like just to mention that the, the membership uh, form that we that I have shared in the, uh, at the beginning of um, IYCN is free, so you can freely join the, the network in which concerns the EYCN. So uh, if you are a member of a young chemists network within your own country that belongs to uh, EUCAM, so you are automatically part of uh, EYCN. So just to mention this, nevertheless, if you have some doubts, please reach us. You have the contact, so don't hesitate to reach us. So um, uh, and now I would like just to, uh, to mention so uh, a big thank you to, to uh, uh, all, all colleagues within both networks. So this uh, would haven't been possible at all without all of them. So they really, really made a, a huge effort during the last weeks uh, organizing this uh, uh, event that I really uh, hope that you have enjoyed and that you keep uh, supporting uh, um, uh, us through continuing these kind of initiatives and bring uh, many more. So as you can see, I'd like uh, very much to thank Laurie. She is the chair of uh, uh, IYCN, Bailey is the, uh, we share elect. Max is the is the secretary of EYCN. Antonio is the chair of EYCN. Maxim, the communications team leader at EYCN, and Sebastian, as you have heard, is the uh, social media chair at EYCN. So, I'd like to thank you also again very much to all of you uh, for your help and for joining uh, efforts in this uh, initiative. But I think that it was quite engaging. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, to uh, uh, IUPAC and Delcams for the kind support and for dissemination of this uh, initiative for the media. And uh, uh, now I would like also to uh, uh, ask uh, Javier if, if you could give some uh, uh, final remarks to uh, all the speakers and all please. please. Well, absolutely. I uh, just want to, to let you all know that the bo both videos will be uploaded into the IUPAC YouTube channel. So for the ones you have not been able to join us, uh, you will have the, these webinars. On the web the other thing is that we are going to be sharing also small pieces of the video in our social media um, and another way to 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 thrive is doing exactly what you guys have been doing today organizing things through leadership you feel that you are contributing you are extremely creative we are we feel extremely proud of you and with that on behalf of how back thank you guys uh, you, you you are showing that chemists are really contributing in this fight again uh, the coronavirus and also that we can thrive also from home not in a regular circumstances we understand that but um, you guys have done a terrific job congratulations thank you everyone i i think this is a, a nice uh, time to to end the discussion uh, as javier was saying joao was mentioning please uh, i mean all the information will be shared with you on the uh, afterwards on, the, on our social media, on the, on the YouTube channel. So all the information will be there. Um, the speakers, uh, thank you everyone and all the participants. Um, uh, see you in the next time. Thank you, bye.